Mark, well, I'm excited. We're about two minutes after. I know we, I don't want to start this too late. Let me scroll down here. We have 121 so far. I know more will jump on. Uh, oh, wow. Mark, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Uh, no pun intended. We were just talking about <laughs> going to have a plan. That just happened. That just, you know, that, that, that works. Uh, that works. <laughs> Uh, Mark uh, and Mark and everybody else listening. Uh, my name is Tyler with Bedford Cameron Video. We have Mark Farb from uh, Sigma, and he has an awesome presentation for us. Uh, I'm going to monitor the chat in YouTube. So if you have any questions, please put those in YouTube, uh, so that way I can you know write those down and and, and you know put the same questions that everybody's asking together, and uh, uh, that way Mark can answer those at the end of the presentation. Uh, we want to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, so, Mark, I'm just going to uh, let you have the have the floor here. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, so, for those of you who are just joining or, or did not hear, uh, Mark Farb, Sigma Tech Rep, also commercial photographer. So, I've been doing this, um, been in the photo industry for more than 25 years, been uh, shooting for more than 40 years. So, just a little bit of experience um, going from film to digital and everything in between. I still shoot film periodically. Um, but today's presentation is something that I, is one of my favorite, actually, because even as experienced as I am and other people are, I like to review uh, basics or things that people take for granted when they're, you know, grabbing the camera bag and headed out or they're starting to think about new lenses to add to the bag. You know, I keep hearing things from different people of I need this, I need that. But um there's a lot, a tremendous amount of information in here. And um, as always, we're, we're available for answering questions before, during, and after the presentation. Um, so I'm always available for questions. So with that said, I'm going to go and share my screen. And everybody should see this. So um, Basically, what we want to cover today, we're going to talk about types of lenses, focal length, angle of view. Angle of view is an important one that I, I mentioned only because we're talking about full frame cameras and crop sensor cameras and where you're able to kind of mix and match and do things with both style lenses. And there, there's some important information, especially with the crop sensor cameras uh, and lenses that are designed specifically for the APS-C style cameras. Uh, there are physical focal length numbers on those camera on those lenses, and the the numbers that people kind of get jammed up with is the angle of view or what the full frame equivalent would be when you put it onto a specific camera. So if you're shooting, depending on whose camera you're shooting, there's a something called a crop factor involved, and it's a multiplier. It's like adding a teleconverter without losing any light. So <clears throat> you have um, anywhere from one three to a one seven multiplier out there in, in the field, depending on whose camera you've got there. So that would be the equivalent of, you know, when you add that number in there, that's what you're shooting focal length wise for a full frame, but it's giving you the angle of view based on what's on the camera. And I have some images that'll actually help clarify that a little bit. So we talk about Prime lenses, zoom lenses, um, you know, short, medium, long telephotos, fish eyes, normal or what's considered a normal focal length or normal lens and wide angle or ultra wide angle lenses. And um, a lot of times people think that, you know, in order to have professional results these days, you need a prime lens. Unfortunately, that's not the case anymore, or I should say fortunately. Um, We've all come a long way in lens manufacturing and design where back in the film days, I would have said, absolutely, you're not a professional unless you're shooting a, a prime because it's faster, sharper, and cleaner, period, hands down. Uh, zoom lenses today have improved so dramatically that you'd be hard pressed to see the difference in quality from, from either one. But if you're a purist and you want to go that direction, that's great. Sometimes it gives you the advantage to, to make your work stand out a little differently than other people's work. Um, you know, it, it becomes chocolate vanilla. It's your choice. So, but I do encourage people to go into the store, put things in your hand and try things out. Uh, there are times that we do hands-on demonstrations where get in the store, put it on the camera, check it out yourself. Don't take our word for it. I mean, I have 
plenty of images to, to outline and show what I'm talking about, but there's no experience for, uh, there's no replacement for experience other than putting it on and doing it yourself. Um, minimum focus distance is something that's very important because a lot of times people forget that every lens, every focal length has what they call a minimum focus distance. So if you get too close, uh, your, your lens won't focus and your images come up soft and then you, you have a hard time and get frustrated, but you've just got to understand what you're working with, you know, as, as these are tools in the toolbox. So you want to constantly be mindful of what a minimum focus distance is or um, understand where to be or how to use that to your advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, depth of field and depth of focus is something that truly confuses the heck out of people. Um, because again, you think that if like in depth of field, if your focus point is on a zero point and you focus, you've got a little focus behind and a little bit of focus in front, people think that actually is there, there's something wrong there. No, not the case. And I have a screen or a website that I love to show. It's a depth of field calculator that's online that you can even put on your phone. And it's a great teaching tool. It shows you <clears throat> exactly what the depth of field would be of a given camera and lens set up at everything from minimum focus distance out to like 50, 60 feet. And it breaks it down and shows you, you know, camera to subject, subject to background. And it explains different things, which goes to shooting with compression because using a longer lens uh, with a variable aperture, sometimes, a lot of times, you can actually create beautiful bokeh or out of focus area in the background. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. That you think that you can only do with a fixed aperture or a prime lens. Not the case. I'll show that to you as well. Um, exposure triangle. This is something that's real important to, to get the most out of your camera and lens combination. So there's always a way to get back to uh, point A from utilizing what you have with you. So, you know, you can, you can adjust a couple of variables and I'll explain that as well too. And then stabilization and motion blur. These are two things that definitely uh, play into action sports or uh, denoting speed in an image where understanding how the stabilizer is working with you or against you, depending on what you're doing. So there is many ways to use that for you. And of course, the motion, motion blur, um, being able to do something called dragging the shutter and show, you know, show an image that shows speed as opposed to just stopping action, you know, right as it happens. Sometimes you do want to stop the action. Sometimes you don't want to stop the action. So, you know, as I said before, talking about, you know, what's normal. Traditionally, um, anything from a 30 to a 55 millimeters, 60 millimeters is considered a normal focal length. So back in the film days, when you bought a camera body, you got the nifty 50. That was your, your kit lens. And the 50 millimeter lens is your normal eye view, which is gives you an angle of view of 48.6 degrees. So while you know, on a regular full frame camera or a, you know, 35 millimeter negative, 50 millimeters is what you would normally see just looking at a situation. If you put that 50 millimeter lens onto a, a crop sensor camera, so like you've got the nifty 50 and you want to put it onto say um, an A6400, it will give you the angle of view or the appearance of shooting with something equivalent to an 80 to an 85 millimeter lens, which is great for portrait work. But on a full frame camera, you wouldn't want to use that 50 to do portraits because it, it tends to pin cushion um, the image depending on how close you are. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. And, I'll, and I'll, again, a couple of images to illustrate that. Um, a wide angle lens. So <clears throat> typically 24 or 28 millimeters is considered wide angle up to that 30 millimeter mark. But you can also go the other direction, which is extreme wide angle, which would be anywhere from 12 to 24 millimeters. And uh, like we have both a 12 to 24 and a 14 to 24 in our lineup. While you're in that fisheye territory of that 12 millimeters, um, our wide angle lenses are highly corrected. So you've got that, that curved front element, which shows you that it is actually um, highly corrected. 
fisheye lenses, you would see the bubble on the inside of the glass and it's uncorrected. So it's giving you a 180 degree point of view and you're, you're seeing the bending of perspective where the corrected ones straighten out your lines and give you straight edges. So, uh, and in fish eyes, there are two types. Actually, there are three types. <clears throat> there are a couple of companies that make what they call a fish eye zoom, which is really just an highly uncorrected wide angle lens that they're marketing for a lot of money. A real fisheye is a single focal length and it's either a circular fisheye, which is looking through the porthole. So you've got that bubble or what they call a rectangular fisheye. And that's the entire frame at 180 degrees, which can be great, but you've got to be careful when you're shooting that because it's really easy to get your feet or your hands or, or something else in the image that you really don't want. But uh, when I'm doing event work or certain types of concert work, I'll use that rectangular fisheye because it gives me the entire view of everything at 180 degrees. But you've got to be careful too because that can get overplayed quickly and it, it can be a little cumbersome. Um, we talked about zoom lenses. So you have multi-purpose zooms um, or, or telephotos. Now you've got lenses like, you know, 18 to 300, 18 to 400, um, 28 to 300. And these are great all-in-one lenses that you don't have to worry about changing lenses, but sometimes that's not exactly what you're looking for. So if you're starting out, it's a great way to jump in and throw a lens on a camera and go out and figure out where you want to be and <clears throat> what exactly do I need or not need as far as a lens goes. And then I mentioned before the zoom lenses versus fixed lenses, you know, advantages, disadvantages. Basically, it comes down to do I want to carry multiple lenses or do I want to carry one lens? Or certain cases, you can't carry too much weight because you're going in a situation where you're limited to bag weight. So for argument's sake, you're going on safari, you're getting on one of these little puddle jumpers. They will weigh your camera bag at the plane side and you're not allowed to have more than 25 pounds in that bag. Otherwise, something stays on the tarmac or you're staying on the tarmac. So a lens like a 60 to 600, you know, this is a one-stop shop for a full 10X zoom where uh, you're able to travel light or lighter and have extra memory cards, a bottle of water, um, you know, batteries, things that you need in the bag, but you're able to do everything from 60 millimeters out to 600 millimeters in one lens. And then of course, one of my favorites, macro lenses. Um, you know, macro could be close up or shooting life size, one-to-one -one photography. And you can use macro lenses for more than just shooting pictures of, of bugs and flowers and stamps and coins and stuff like that. I'll use a macro lens for sports because of, of the properties of the lens. I love doing portrait work with a macro lens because again, it's a single focal length what they call a flat field lens. So it, it achieves infinity focus much quicker. So I could shoot a little bit more wide open and have plenty of compression and get amazing images with the macro lens. So there, there are a lot of ways that you can incorporate that into your photography in addition to having other lenses in the bag. When I mentioned before about sensors and sensor size, here's a quick chart about all the different sensors that are out there currently. And um, it gets confusing fast, but, you know, we, we are here to kind of dispel that. <laughs> so the green box to show you is what the crop sensor lens or the crop, yeah, the crop sensor sees in the, in the crop camera versus what the full frame sensor sees with the same lens. So using a 70 to 200. And if you notice on the bottom of the images, by the way, all the images are set up this way. We have all the exif information and this should help show different cameras, different focal lengths, uh, different settings. So again, uh, this was shot with a 70 to 200 and this would be the representation from just changing over from a crop camera to a full frame camera, same image. So this is how you would see that. And in some cameras, what happens is that if you put, um, like for I would say you're shooting crop lens on a full frame camera uh, in Nikon, it, it'll actually shade the box in the viewfinder. And what you're seeing in that shaded box 
is the actual image that you're capturing. So you've got an, a, an outside area that's kind of blacked out and that's what you're negating. So, you know, what's in the center frame is what you want to compose and how you want to use that, which is great. And there are times that I will put a crop sensor lens on a full frame camera that is able to bounce back and forth because maybe it has properties like a fast aperture, like F1.8, that allows me to shoot on a faster frame rate, um, like a D4S, 12 frames a second. And I need F1.8 out of the 18 to 35 because I'm shooting some concert work and I'm climbing into a drum kit. So I want the drummer, I want everything that I need, but I need the frame rate to show motion of the hands and the sticks, but yet I'm working in the darkest corner of the stage. Here's a, a great physical example of just changing camera bodies. So 800 millimeter lens and with a full frame body on it, shooting the flower across the yard. And then all I did was take the camera off and throw on a crop sensor camera. So it gives me the angle of view of what 1200 millimeters would look like, which can work out really well, especially, especially if you're a nature photographer. Sometimes you don't wanna use a teleconverter or you don't have the affordability to do so. So it gives you a little extra punch and you're able to get a lot more out of it. So if you're looking for more telephoto, putting on that full frame telephoto lens onto your crop camera works out real well. So if you need to travel smaller and lighter, like a 100 to 400 works out perfectly for doing something like that because it's giving you the, you know, the magnification and equivalent of, of having close to 600 millimeters in a two pound lens. Or if you've got a 150 to 600 or a 60 to 600, you're reaching out to almost or just under a thousand millimeters with that crop factor. So here, this is what um, the focal lengths look like physically. And as, as these scroll, you'll see that I've got the crop sensor and the full frame equivalent and giving you the angle of view. So as you see, as we zoom in, you're using your telephoto, it's giving you a shallower or a narrower depth of view or angle of view. So advantage is that it adds compression. So it, it actually looks like there's more inherent depth of field as you're compressing the image. And this should take us all the way up to like the 300 millimeter mark, I believe. Um, and this should just keep scrolling through as we go. And as we get closer and closer, you notice that the background is getting more compressed and we're concentrating more. And the, the angle of view that you're seeing is very narrow. So, <clears throat> you know, here, I stop here because this is generally where most people would have their 150 to 500, 150 to 600. And this is what you're looking at angle of view wise. So as, again, as you're going in there, this is what you would see. So you're getting rid of some of the extraneous background and being able to concentrate on what you want from a further distance. Um, I like to show this because again, everybody has these scales and these little windows and buttons on their, their lenses. This is actually kind of important because depending on what you're doing, especially when you have lenses that say, um, you know, it has a macro capability like a 1770 or a 2470 that has macro ability or uh, the 18 to 300, which has macro in the name. While those are not true macro, they're giving you magnification, at least, you know, half life size magnification or, or approaching that one to one life size replication and showing you at different footages, which is part of the other um, piece that you have here in like the 30 millimeter lens. That little window is telling you in feet and meters is how far away from your subject that you are. So you'll see that you have an infinity symbol on one end of the scale, and then you have a minimum focus distance on the other end of the scale. So this is allowing you to, to drill in to where you need to be. So like if you need to be very specific about what you're shooting and it allows you to, to use the, the footage scale. So if you need to focus manually, uh, it gives you a better idea of where you're at uh, footage wise. So also in with the macro capability, it's, it's showing you that um, at 0.22 meters or 0.72 feet, these are the magnifications that you've got for your macro capability. Um, and then the bottom left is actually, you, I'm sure you've seen a series of these switches all the time where you've got your autofocus, manual focus switch, um, the 
uh, the limit switch. I just helped somebody this morning that they thought their lens was broken and they accidentally moved the switch. So it wasn't focusing in a range. If you're not skilled at using the limit switch, I would suggest leaving it in full because what you're doing is that you have a minimum focus to a mid-range point and then mid-range to infinity and then full. So it's telling you that I'm only concentrating on focus in these ranges. So leaving it on full allows you to go from minimum focus to the moon and back. Um, in days gone by, I would say, yes, the limit switch is important for sports uh, because, again, uh, you're able to make the lens work faster. The focus motors in, in today's lenses are blistering fast. You before you could say the word infinity, it's already done the minimum focus to infinity and locked focus for you uh, without any problems whatsoever. Then you have the OS switch, which is your OS IS VR stabilization. So position one is generally for hand holding, which would be up, down, side to side movement of your camera body. And then position two is, is if you're mounted and panning. So if you're on a monopod or a tripod and you're chasing someone running down a field, that's where you would use the panning feature or you're chasing a plane in the air or you're chasing a, you know, a car running across the racetrack, you know, stuff like that. Now, where people do get a little confused too about stabilization is it doesn't remove um, shake in the image. It's supposed to remove camera shake when your shutter speeds are slower than normal. So in theory, you know, anything that when your shutter speed dips below one over your focal length. So for argument's sake, in theory, a hundred millimeter lens, anything below a hundredth of a second, you're supposed to support the camera because they're worried about shaking. Typically, most people can handhold to a 60th of a second with no problem. On long lenses, um, it depends on the weight of the lens and your focal length that you're shooting at because some people are better and built differently and can stabilize a long lens because they're a bigger person or have a, a steadier stance. So they can shoot a 500 or a 600 millimeter focal length lens at a 300th of a second or a 200th of a second and not worry about shake. I am not one of those people. So stabilization for me is important because again, when my shutter speeds start dipping, that five pound lens or that three pound lens, I need to turn the stabilizer on to eliminate some of my actual movement. And when you start going longer on the lens, you will see vibration and movement. So the aperture scale, um, basically what this is, is your iris of your eye. How much light am I letting in? And this is also where it, it correlates to that exposure triangle. So if you make a triangle on a piece of paper and write aperture, shutter, ISO on the, on the three points, you can get to the same point by making an adjustment to one or all three of those based on what you've got on your camera. And uh, the way it works is that the more light you let in, the faster your shutter speed goes. So shutter and aperture work opposite each other. So if you open the aperture, your shutter speed will go up. If you close the aperture down, your shutter speed goes down. So if you're shooting at F22, you're going to have a much slower aperture unless you bump ISO. And then there comes a point where you don't want the ISO to go too high because then you start introducing um, noise or grain into the image, which some can be removed in post, but some gets a little ugly. So you have to kind of decide where it works best for you. And the other thing to keep in mind, though, is, you know, um, and, and I'll talk about the aperture scale as well in here is because, again, with aperture is depth of field. And as you close the aperture down, you're getting more focus through your image. A shallower depth of field means that your focus is narrower. So for argument's sake, if you're shooting an 85 millimeter lens or, or 50 millimeter lens at f1.4, it is quite possible to actually lose focus from here to here. Now, that said, um, you want to find an aperture that's going to give you, you know, if you're doing a portrait, you want to do f5.6 typically on a single person or f4 to f5.6 as that gives you enough depth of field to go from here to roughly about here. And that gives you plenty to, to, to work with. Um, this is also where I'll show you the, that screen for 
um, the, the online depth of field calculator to help with that. So here's an example of shooting at f1.8 with some constant lights. And this is a father-son cosplay team. They do Templar Knights. So I wanted to do something kind of neat and different where the father is in the foreground and I'm shooting as close to wide open as I can in an 80th of a second. And I just want the son in the background so you have that contrast between father and son. Playing the aperture game and, and not going all the way through every aperture. But if I change it up and go to F16, um, you can see that foreground and background are in focus. Now, as I started to mention, is that you've got to be mindful of the lens that you're working with because not every lens is going to be tack sharp at F16. Um, as you stop down, there comes a point where the lens loses sharpness because, again, it's you're not in the power band of the sharpness range of the lens. And that's what an MTF chart shows you is where the contrast kind of falls off. Every manufacturer makes them look a little different. Uh, you'll have to decide where your best sharpness is, but typically um, anywhere from, you know, F4 to F11, F14 is a pretty safe bet that you, you're going to have the sharpest image out of that lens regardless. Uh, lesser expensive lenses will peak in sharpness probably around F8. So that's like the kit lens. Those are not the sharpest past F8. Um, as you get into better lenses, then you have better glass in there and they, they kind of compensate for all of that as you're going along. So showing you playing the depth of field game, doing a selective focus and how different the image can take on a feel. So again, working with some cosplayers, you know, focus on the end of the gun where it's like, you know, just got stuck in your face kind of a thing versus you want to see the scale, you want to see the look and it gives you a different feel, but playing a very shallow depth of field, even at F4.5, you can see how narrow that depth of field is based on the distance that I'm shooting from my subject. This is the, uh, the online depth of field calculator I was talking about. This is called Depth of Field Master um, or DOF, uh, 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 depth, uh, yeah, DOF, uh, dot com or do depth of field master.com this will bring that up and you could plug in everything that you've got equipment wise and it will break all of this down for you and there's like four or five pages of amazing information and it's it's a great teaching tool that i use all the time um, even as a skilled seasoned photographer i use this quite a bit and what's neat is that you can see that by just changing your camera going from a 7d to a 5d how the same lens can give you different features um, or different parameters. But something to note is that your, your actual aperture does not change. So, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes people think that, well, if, I, you know, if I'm putting this lens onto a crop camera, that the aperture is changing. No, the aperture is not changing. What you are changing is the compression that you get from that same combination. You know, an iris opening is an iris opening. That will never change. So uh, and when you talk about perspective, you talk about lenses, uh, you know, what do I want to choose when I'm going out there? You know, wide angle lenses are definitely going to spread out the background and give you, you know, more of an emphasis on where you are and the, and the grand expanse and distance. Um, you know, that's you're able to include a lot around your subject where sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's not what you want. So you've got to kind of pick and choose. Uh, when I'm shooting event work, personally, I'll, I actually carry two camera bodies, one with a short wide lens and one with a long, longer telephoto or long lens because I don't want to take time to switch lenses. But again, that's how I operate uh, when I'm shooting. If you don't, then yeah, you would take time to actually swap a lens out and be able to, to shoot however you need to, you know, telephoto lenses actually help you isolate your subject from the background and allow you to incorporate some of that bokeh, if you will. Uh, you don't have to shoot, you know, uh, at F14 for everything. There are times that you will want to, because again, you're trying to control certain aspects of light, but 
um, telephoto lenses compress the distance in the, and of the foreground and background. So again, um, like, and, and I show this picture of the truck in the desert again later on, but you know, that's up in the Nevada mountains where it looks like I, I've got a painted backdrop behind the truck. And meanwhile, I'm actually shooting a quarter of a mile away from that truck. Um, and I'll show that image again, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but um, you know, you're able to do a lot more with the telephoto lens than you would think. Sometimes doing landscape shooting, you may want to use that telephoto lens to compress everything and get a different perspective based on what you're shooting. So showing you how different your perspective can change by just changing focal length. These three vases are actually um, stationary on the fence and tripod is set up. So we started at the wide angle on the, like an 18 to 300. Um, and we decided to say, okay, well, this is what they look like at full wide angle. As I zoom in, you can see how it changes. The background compresses a little bit and it looks like I moved the vases, but I didn't. All I did was change my focal length. So, and if you notice the background is nice and soft and out of focus, um, that's, that's where you're gaining that compression and it allows you to do a few more things with the one lens. So here's a great example of shooting the same situation with the one lens and how it changes and takes on a totally different feel just by zooming in. Now, we've all done this where we've, we've taken that portrait out in beautiful blue skies and well, the skies go white because now we, you know, the camera's trying to average out all of that light and figure out what to do. So it blows out the sky because it's trying to open the shadows of, of the, the black material on the clothing. And at wide angle, this is where it's very unappealing um, to the end user because again, like the, the leg that's closest to the lens looks over-exaggerated, looks bigger and heavier than it actually is. So by zooming in just a little bit, we get rid of the extraneous background. And if immediately you see how the leg changed shape and it compressed it and made it more natural. And you're able to do a little bit more there. And then of course, zooming in even tighter, it opens the shadows a little bit more and it concentrates getting rid of all of the background, filling your frame with something that's more appropriate for what you're actually trying to achieve here. So, Again, as I mentioned before, you can do lots of different things with the same lenses or different lenses and use them as they're not touted as being used. So like I said, doing a landscape portrait or a landscape photo with uh, a telephoto lens. So again, the story is I'm in the Nevada desert chasing after wild horses. And well, I saw the truck. I love trucks. So I'm, I'm actually running backwards down this dirt road, looking back through my viewfinder because I only had one long lens with me. And I'm looking back at the background and I love the way that the clouds and the light were dancing on the mountains in the background. So I finally get to a point where I, I like what I'm seeing. So I laid down in the road to get the right angle of view back up at the truck and incorporate as much of the background as possible because standing up, I didn't see all that background. So I'm praying to God that nobody comes flying through this dirt road to run me over. But yet, I'm shooting this um, lands beautiful landscape shot with a big telephoto that's you know used for nature photography. Um, doing portrait work, like I said, with the macro lens, I love because again, it allows me to pull out amazing detail out of the clothing, the dress, the person, and the background goes soft. So I, I create the bokeh and I'm creating tremendous detail with that macro lens. And when we talk about bokeh or it's your out of focus area, uh, something that, that helps design that in your lens and, and camera combination is the diaphragm in your lens. Now, lesser expensive lenses have uh, fewer aperture blades. So sometimes it could be a four or a five blade aperture where you're getting this hexag hex hexagonal um, shape of the circle as you open up to your widest aperture, as light is coming through there. And it, it doesn't make for a very pleasing, creamy background. Something that, that makes our lenses a little different than everybody else's is that the aperture blades are actually rounded. So um, even at 
lesser depth of field, your your aperture is still giving you a more rounded spherical um, specular highlight in your image. And something else that we tout is that we have anywhere from from nine to eleven aperture blades in all of our lenses, so it gives you a smoother transition in that. Um, spherical image to begin with so it makes the backgrounds very creamy very the specular highlight becomes very attractive um, and this becomes notable when you start going out and shooting different subject matter so like the 24 105 is a go-to lens for me when i'm doing event work i love doing um, quick portraits with it as well so when i do the the new york city halloween parade uh, the 24 105 is my go-to for all my portrait work and I'll use a prime, probably a 50 millimeter most of the time for all of the, the bigger floats or the dancing or the bigger events where I want everybody to see what I'm seeing as I'm standing in the parade per, uh, procession. So uh, in this particular image, it happens that I pulled this person over the line and into the parade route. And I, I love the makeup, but I also love the interaction of her friend who was just blown away at the fact that I just loved her makeup and, and her getup. So I'm shooting with uh, this particular one. I did pop a flash and um, was able to get a little bit more of the nuances of her makeup, which was very um, ghoulish, for lack of a better way of explaining it. This is one of my favorite examples of showing you that you can take a variable aperture lens like the 60 to 600 and do killer portrait work with beautiful out of focus area in the background or bokeh. So we're at F6.3. I'm at 280 millimeters and I am not using a flash. I'm using the available light. So I'm using the light that's reflecting underneath this gazebo and able to do some portrait work with this young person and, and create some killer images. And then of course, having the additional reach allows me to come in super tight because again, I love storytelling. So the reflection in her glasses gives you a, a, an example of you know surroundings, but I'm also, when I do portrait work, I'm all about eyes. And again, she's just got incredibly gorgeous eyes and relatively flawless skin, which is another admirable, admirable thing for a model. But uh, again, I'm able to pull it all together with one lens and look at the background you would never believe that we're shooting this at f6.3, but because of the compression of that longer lens, you're able to achieve that. And with a longer lens, you're able to actually shoot a more wide open aperture depending on your distances from your subject. So here I'm able to use that longer 120 to 300 focal length and shoot wide open at f2.8 and create a, a very cool portrait in midday light. Um, higher shutter speed, but again, playing the game of adjusting. And this is back to where I was talking about that exposure triangle. So if you think about that for a second, a triangle is, no matter how you cut it up, it's always 180 degrees. So by utilizing the aperture shutter um, and ISO, you can make adjustments on one or all three of those to get to the same point and achieve the same image that you're trying to get. So we were talking about normal lenses or normal zooms and ultra wides, you know, what, where am I going? Where am I headed? What am I doing? Um, you know, this is something that you have to think about. It's like, well, how much do I want to carry at a given time or where am I headed? What am I doing? Um, you know, the, the image of, of the large array in New Mexico was done actually with the 24 to 35 millimeter lens. And it allows me to get an incredibly wide expanse you know, in the middle of the night and exposed properly because again, it's a, it's a faster aperture lens. So I can use a lower ISO, get a little bit of the, the night skies. Um, the Milky Way was kind of off to the other side a little bit, but I loved how these radar dishes kind of like popped in the arrangement that they were in. Um, believe it or not, on the, the concert there, that's shooting on Fremont Street in Las Vegas. That's the third street stage. And I was actually using two lenses. I used an 18 to 300 and a 24 105. And they both performed amazingly. So depending on where I needed to be, um, I was able to, to bounce back and forth between the two lenses. So here, we're just gonna show off some images. 
Uh, again, that 24105 working just streetlight. That's all I'm working with. And you can see, you know, F4 is a great place to be. It doesn't have to be F1.8. You know, you make some adjustments and you look at the ISO, ISO 3200 at a hundredth of a second, I'm golden. Um, and this is back to talking about panning and um, where the stabilizer comes in, into play and also depending on distance. So the first one in the top left, I'm shooting a 24105 on the tarmac as these guys are pulling out onto the runway to go for takeoff. And uh, this was, I was doing a whole series of images of pilots in their planes. But again, I love the fact that, you know, again, access for this was very limited because again, I'm specialized in where I am and what I'm doing, but I love the reflection of the runway, the sky and the, the wing of the plane in his visor. Um, but the fact that I'm that close, again, safety is a huge form factor here. Um, and you could see that the top right and bottom left, these are great panning examples where um, slower shutter speeds, but I'm panning with the plane so I can get the smoke moving with the plane so it shows speed. Um, the, the top right was actually kind of a happy accident. I was actually standing out deep on the field on the back of a pickup truck as these guys were reenacting the Battle of Midway. And I was concentrating on the torpedo plane when the other guy thought he was going to have some fun and basically dive bomb the pickup truck that I was standing on with another person and see if they could scare us, which they did a pretty good job. But the happy accident here was that because of me concentrating on the plane coming inbound, he zooms through my, my frame. And because of the slower shutter speed, that all came together perfectly. So while I didn't intend to have that happen, it worked out really, really well. Um, the bottom right is again, I'm panning as these guys are, are turning on the smoke and coming in for a strafing run. So again, I'm panning with them, but also love the compression of the head on shot. And you can see that I've got the uh, blur on the prop. So I am shooting slower shutter speeds. And you know, with that said in, in aviation stuff, there is something to be said about um, the full disc blur. Um, which you can only truly achieve, by the way, if the direction of light is working in your favor. You know, I love listening to the arguments about shutter speed and um, panning and this and that, and, you know, how slow can I be? And, you know, how the engine speed and the RPM, let me tell you something, nobody talks about RPMs or engine speeds on, on the flight line. It's, you know, you go for broke and you do what you have to do and you watch for that direction of light, which is important for that. So, <clears throat> It's a matter of where do you feel comfortable? How slow can you sh shoot without getting shaken your images? And depending on the day, sometimes it's slower than others, but you, you've you got to experiment and find that happy medium in there somewhere, you know, yourself. Shooting um, a fast aperture lens, but in really challenging conditions. So again, I love playing with reflections. So one of my favorite lenses that never gets talked about um, is the 50 to 100 which is for the crop sensor cameras. But again, because of the fast aperture, I will use that lens in certain situations for concert work because of the aperture, because of conditions that I can shoot in. And I will put that on a full frame camera and sacrifice pixel count because of the sharpness of the images that I can get. So here we're working in a pretty dark studio. The only light that's coming in is a little bit of afternoon light. And the only light that I'm actually working with, to be honest, are the makeup lights surrounding the mirror. And a little trick for you guys and girls, if you're shooting into mirrors and you want to do reflections, move your focus point and lock focus at the edge of the frame of the mirror or the reflection. Because if you try to, to lock focus on the face or something in the reflection, you get a false positive and it kind of gives you a wonky response. Even though it says it's locked, it'll come up soft because it's just not giving you a, a correct depth of field. Um, so again, I wanted the true, the real person to be slightly out of focus. So I focused right at the edge of the mirror, held my focus lock and then recomposed. So I'm, I've got her looking in the mirror at me or looking at herself, I should say. Extreme wide angle lens working from the jump seat of a plane while these guys are getting ready to jump for the 
early part of the day. Um, and you can see that even with a wide angle lens, um, you've got tremendous depth of field, even at F 4.5. Now, mind you, if you notice that the, um, the, the jumper's head is a little out of focus because he's that close to me. So he's maybe 10 inches, 12 inches from me, but it was more important to actually to have him as a reference in the plane in focus there. And um, as you can see at a 320th of a second, I stopped motion on the stunt plane, but we're also at 21,000 feet. So these guys are getting ready to jump out for the first jump of the day with the American flag. And then the stunt plane is supposed to blow, blow red, white, and blue smoke around these guys as they come down on the ground. So um, while, you know, the jumper is, is checking markers and, and everything else like that, he's, he's kind of violating my minimum focus, but it's okay. And I'm not about to tell an army ranger, you can't do that uh, or move over. Um, not exactly good protocol when he's actually working, but it actually, the, the composition and everything else works perfect. This is what I was talking about with an extreme wide angle lens, how I'm able to get straight lines. You don't have the bending of perspective in there and it's a great tight shot. Using a long lens for portrait work when you wouldn't expect to. So I backed this person into the edge of an alleyway and used the, the, um, the sunlight, the, the mid afternoon light that was brushing across the top of the building uh, just enough to get over the brim of her hat. So again, being able to open the metering a little bit and play the shadow game, because again, I love the eyes and just to have enough light to kind of uh, mystify the image a little bit. So again, utilizing a lens to do something that you wouldn't normally do, which can be done. Get creative, think outside the box. So we talked about zooms and and now we'll talk about prime lenses a little bit um you know the first image is actually uh the the 12 to 24 and i did the same shot with the 14 to 24 <clears throat> that ramp that you see going down underneath the wonder wheel is about a 15 degree incline and i'm laying on the pavement facing the camera back up at the the ferris wheel and this is somewhere around 10 30 11 o'clock at night so I've got the beautiful black sky or as much of a black sky as I can get in Brooklyn um, with that said. And what's even more entertaining is the fact that the people that are in that doorway, they basically stepped over me and kept walking with me laying face down on the ground, not wondering if there's anything wrong with me or anything, but, you know, like, okay, guy with a camera, we're just going to keep moving along. Um, the fisheye lens, this, the, the shot on the right was actually done with the 15 millimeter fisheye, which is a rectangular fisheye. And Victor is a um, very colorful individual. I loved the tattoo in the rings and the fact that he's just a character. And the, the close focus on that fisheye is about three inches off the front element. So he was actually throwing up the horns and, and the performer that's up on stage is actually talking about the two of us down in the pit while you know we're having some fun down in, in the uh, photographer's pit so i'm able to get the entire stage in there and then get the performer in and show you know kind of some cool stuff that's going on there so that's actually the shot and um you know again um you can see he's very very strong in his political views which i don't express uh one way or the other but again interesting individual and uh very cool image doing night skies. So this is where a fast prime lens definitely works for you. So shooting <clears throat> wide open at, at 25 seconds, ISO 1600 gives me great illumination of you know the night sky and the foreground. Um, and by the way, the lights on top of that little structure are uh, battery operated LEDs. And there is a red LED inside the structure a, a red tea light, as a matter of fact, to give you the glow of like a, a campfire or something going on. And uh, while you're able to expose properly for the outside to give you that kind of a, a shot. Um, fun portrait images. Uh, yes, I, I am a Jets fan, considering that I, I live here up in the Northeast. I like the underdog. Um, and the fans are actually more colorful and more entertaining than, than the team is or game can be. So sometimes it's just more fun to turn the lens back on the crowd. Um, you know, here's a season ticket holder and he's very proud of his, uh, 
lineage there. Doing a little street photography with, with the 14 millimeter. So again, uh, using a lens that's designed for something a little differently. So playing the perspective game, getting myself at the right height and not getting the bending of perspective, but showing the correct relationship of where I need to put the camera to the subject to get straight lines or a pleasing image. And by the way, the, the red in the background is not a Photoshop ad. That is actually a street light that, that turned red. So as it turned red, green, or yellow, I got a different appearance on the background and I kind of like the red. So we talked about that whole ISO thing um, and shutter and the, the exposure triangle. And again, when you need to stop your action, that's where faster shutter speeds come into play. So you can bump your ISO a little bit to get a faster shutter speed if you need to. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to shoot wide open. So again, the slower shutter speed being able to, to show speed, but also um, help you with your panning and get, you know, focus lock on your subject and, and maintain that. And by the way, to practice, um, go to a park, get out on the road and Practice, practice your panning skills with slower shutter speeds. You know, start at a hundredth of a second and follow focus on something with, you know, a person riding a bicycle or a kid running up and down the field um, at, a, at a football game or a soccer game or something like that. And then consistently turn your shutter speeds down to see where you feel comfortable at what slower shutter speed. Um, another neat trick too, especially you've got a really bright sunny day and you wanna shoot at a 40th or a 60th of a second, even at ISO 100, that sky tends to go uh, white. So here's where adding a neutral density filter to the front of the lens helps tremendously. I personally use a one and a half stop ND filter when I'm doing aviation to keep my blue skies blue. It allows me to drop my shutter speeds and shoot between a 40th and an 80th of a second and not blow out <clears throat> an afternoon sky. As I mentioned earlier, having the, the correct direction of light. So here at an 80th of a second, I got some great prop blur and you're able to see that, that, that blur. And I love the way, again, as he came in on the, the strafing run, I was able to compress and get that head on shot. Um, I probably could have slowed down just a little bit more, but this particular afternoon, an 80th of a second was all I was willing to do. Going the other tact, um, as he comes in for a high speed pass, pulling like six, 700 miles an hour down the tarmac, about 40 feet over grade, um, having an F-22, uh, shooting at a 2,000th of a second, it's kind of important to have that faster shutter speed and be able to, again, track because he's gone in a blink of an eye. You know, playing the shutter speed game and, and where I'm shooting from in distances. Um, in this case, I wanted F9, by the way, because of depth of field and in my proximity to the guys. I wanted um, because what happens too with depth of field is as you get closer to your subject, that depth of field gets more narrow. So I wanted more inside the truck. I wanted the faces. I wanted the the, the cage. I wanted equipment. I wanted to see as much as possible. And you can even see that. Um, the navigator is sharp, but also starting to blur a little bit because of vibration and movement, but also based on the angle that I'm looking at him and how compressed everything is. So, uh, and you can see from the undercarriage of the truck, the, the angle of view that I'm at, um, the undercarriage is still on par with the driver, but the navigator is slightly further back. So even with that, he's slightly out of the, the plane of focus. Um, playing the game. So I'm, I'm on the cusp of stopping action and, and getting motion blur on the wheels. So I wanted some good action shots um, and this works. So depending on what you're trying to achieve, you know, sometimes you can play that game. And here's a great example of just shooting the long lens from the beach and being able to stop your action. Um, I didn't want the water to be creamy. I wanted, I wanted all of that specular highlight and all the spray in the stream. So again, playing that and this was a handheld shot um i see these guys out on the beach when i go to shoot surfing and they'll use tripods they'll use gimbal heads and you know you're out there waiting 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 for these guys to catch a wave and 
Um, it takes a little bit of practice to, to, for the tracking and the panning to go along with that. And focal length is important. So here uh, I'm doing some air to air work with, with one of the local stunt plane pilots and um, shorter focal length works because he's only about 20 feet off of my wing and I'm shooting out of the door of a, of a high wing plane. And um, by the way, what was kind of neat is, or you see the smile on his face, he's laughing because we hit a pocket of air and went zero gravity. My camera bag is sitting next to me and started floating up out of the plane. So I just kind of grabbed the bag, pushed it down, clicked the seat belt in, and then went back to shooting. And uh, he thought that was impressive. Meanwhile, I'm the guy saying that you're keeping the plane exactly where I'm telling you to. Um, you know, right off of my wing and you're doing everything that I'm telling you to do as I'm shooting. I think that was more impressive, but either way. So now that I threw a tremendous amount of stuff at you guys um, in a very short period of time. So it's time for questions, comments, sarcastic remarks. Well, don't, op don't open it up to sarcastic remarks. You'll, you'll get way too many. Uh <laughs> And I'm talking about myself. I'm just kidding. No, uh, let's see. No, we we had a few comments. I was uh, or questions. I was writing them down so uh, so we can get to them as as efficiently as possible. Uh, for those of you that do have some more questions, please put those in the chat. Uh, we want to get to those as as uh, efficiently as we can. Uh, so, Mark, I have let me get my screen set up here correctly. Okay. Uh, first things first. Uh, yes, this is being recorded. Uh, this is being uh, put onto YouTube live. So uh, you'll be able to uh, see this again after it's uh, finished processing and things like that. Uh, I would give this a, a few hours, probably several hours. Uh, I, I know YouTube is just getting more and more content since we've had to uh, since we, as well as everybody else in the world, had to stream, so uh, just give YouTube a little bit of patience as they process through, you know, hours of live streams going on. Uh, so yes, this is being recorded. I know, Mark, you had a wealth of information, and that's great, <laughs> but it is being recorded, so you can always go back to it later. So uh, yes, this is being recorded, and uh, feel free to take even more notes than you already took while Mark was talking. Uh, uh, as you watch that uh, play back again. Uh, so I have a few people asking the same question here. Uh, but yeah, put, keep, keep putting them in here. Uh, and I'll come back to those other ones as, you're, uh, as you put them in. Uh, so let me go down what I have so far. Uh, what, what focus points do you use uh, from close-ups to landscapes? Uh, Jeffrey had a question. Um, I don't know, if, Jeffrey, if you were asking about... Uh, the event style of photography where you're using that, you know, 24 to 120 or 24 to 105, or if that just is an overall question about you go into a, a specific shooting scenario, how do you choose that focus point? Okay. So, I mean, in general, um, your focus, your cameras use contrast for focus. So regardless of what focal length you're at, you want to find the best point of contrast in your, seen. Now, depending on how skilled you are, or if you're practicing, if I'm doing, say, a, a lacrosse game or a football game, this is my area of focus inside the grill. So I'm looking for the eyes. I want the expression. I want detail inside the helmet. And that'll also apply to playing around with metering patterns, which I didn't even get into. So you want to open those shadows and get a little bit more detail inside the helmet, because usually... Um, that's the darkest part. And especially if they wear the paint under their eyes or if their, their skin tone is a little darker and it's a midday game as most are, especially at the high school and college level, it's just a cave inside here. Uh, motocross, same thing. Um, generally we'll start with depth of field for that too, is because when I'm shooting a sport, I like to shoot at anywhere from six, three to F seven, one, because I want depth of field on one or two players or three players unless I'm isolating one particular player for a, a special reason on the field, um, you know, it could be doing an article on that specific player. So you would definitely go more wide open to eliminate extraneous stuff around them. Um, caveat, if you're shooting a night game and you, and you're on a field that has a 60 watt bulb as the lighting, yes, you need to shoot at F 2 eight, but 
Um, generally with the newer cameras, your ISO ranges are incredible. And if you notice that I had some really high ISO ranges in there, don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to get a shot and have a little bit of grain in your image because having a great shot is better than not having any shot whatsoever. Um, and then you can also play the black and white color game to offset the noise in an image too, which is something else that we could talk about in editing. Um, but yeah, look for the contrast, collar line, helmet, graphics. So even shooting in an F5.6 or a 6.3 or 7.1, if I, if I can only shoot at the numbers on a chest, that helps. Um, in a landscape image, you want to definitely pick something that's the focal point of the image. And you're going to play the depth of field game because you want focus to be pulled right to that focal point as opposed to what am I looking at? You know, don't just throw it out there and expect everybody to figure out, okay, well, you're, you're looking at the trees on the horizon or um, the, the, the constellation in the sky. There's got to be a focus point somewhere in the image. So best point of contrast. And if you're using all of the auto points in your camera, folks, the camera is going to find the better point of contrast and it's not what you think it is. You're thinking person right in front of me. It says, no, I like this garbage pail to the bottom corner of the screen because that's a better contrast. So eliminate all of the auto points, use a center point or a center grouping, and you can move that slightly off center to, to compose and recompose or do a focus lock and then recompose your image. So try that. That, that should be pretty helpful. Excellent. Let's see, I've got a few more. Um, okay. How do you plan for, how do you plan while taking a photo? And I think this had this was specifically with the air show photos. I know there's there's a lot going on. It depends on how many planes are in the air. Uh, but how do you plan? I, this question was asked right after uh, you had, uh, I guess, that dog fight where you had uh, one of the Japanese planes blurry and then the other one was in focus. I know there's a lot going on, but like, how do you plan for uh, setting the focus point? So the neat thing about most air shows is that the performers generally perform the same routine over and over and over again. Um, you can always go on YouTube or look at uh, like the, say the, the Ohio air show. Um, you can pull that up on, on, on the internet and look at some of the performances and they don't deviate a whole lot. The blue angels, the Thunderbirds, um, they do pretty much the same routines every year. They do change it up a little bit periodically, but, and you, you can't be, you know, always on top of everything that they do, but they're pretty consistent. So you can actually review it ahead of time. If you're planning or storyboarding what you're doing, um, they will do the same move two or three times because they'll do a show, right show, left show center, because they want to make sure that everybody gets to see the same thing. Um, so again, the more times that you see certain performers, uh, you'll you'll know their routines and you'll know where to be. Watch for the direction of light and follow them as they come through. Because again, having light on top of them is way better than having light from behind them. So you can you can experiment that way. If you're able to get out to a practice day, so generally you know um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are show days. If though if you have three show days or two show days, the crews always fly in a day before and do a run through of the program the day before a show find out what the airport that they're they're working out of or find out where the show is and find a spot you can get out there and actually shoot the pre-show just like a regular air show and practice so and in the back of your mind or take notes it's like oh okay i know that they're when this guy is up he's going to do this he's going to do this barrel roll he's going to do this this and this and it's, it's all the same. So you can practice and, and actually plan it out that way as well. Very good. This next question has a lot to do with um, portraits. You're, you're showing a couple of different portraits. Uh, a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of uh, people saying that they enjoyed the picture of the, the boy next to the tree. I think it was like a full body shot next to the big trunk. Uh, and that was really cool. Uh, and I had Cora asking, she said, using uh, different lenses and apertures for portraits, uh, specifically with the boy against the tree at 2.8, you said that F4 or 5.6 is better. Would you explain why having a deeper depth of field would be better compared to like a 1.8 or a 2.8 or something like that? 
Well, in this particular case, I use the 120 to 300 for a lot of different things. And I know that if my distance from my subject is, is deep enough, so if I'm at 25, 30 feet away at F28, I've got enough ample depth of field at that deeper focal length that it's giving me the compression of what I want. And because we were shooting in open shade in the middle of the day, um, you know, exposure was, was very tricky. So we experimented a little bit. And then, you know, again, working with kids, their attention span is like a moth in the flame. You know, Jack, Jack was dynamite. Um, he, uh, he and I actually worked really, really well together. He was actually part of a workshop that I was doing. And I loved having this little guy out there with me. So he was a trooper. But um, knowing that attention span is, is, is short, you've got to be able to move quickly. Sometimes you really can't work through those, through those exposure issues. And I know my gear. Knowing your gear is really important. And that's where that particular lens at F2.8 from about 25 feet away um, gives me more than ample depth of field so I can pull that off quickly. And um, I definitely wanted to throw the background out of focus because of the harsh midday light. So um, the, other, the other key here is that, by the way, folks, your eye is automatically pulled to the brightest point of your photograph, period. It's just human nature. So when you're working in those kind of conditions, you've got to try and orchestrate, if you will, you know, all, all of your surrounding conditions. And we were getting a really wicked reflection off the water behind us. So again, another reason that I was playing that game the way I did. So. Definitely. I had a few people ask this question. Uh, would you explain the benefits of using back button focus versus the, the one on the shutter? <laughs> okay. So first of all, it is the most unnatural act you will ever perform with a camera ever. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice and then when you finally get it, it's, it's like a nervous tick. You don't even realize that you're doing it. But advantage is that even on an entry-level camera or a mid-range camera, it's speeding the camera up for you. It is a sports shooter trick. So you're removing one of three functions away from the shutter button, allowing the camera to work faster and more accurately. So you can compose and recompose much faster by wiggling your thumb than you can by trying to do this. Because if the lens is trying to focus and find that fine focus and a meter light and focus at the same time, it, it becomes very cumbersome and slow. But you could take even the slower three to four frames a second camera, like an entry level DSLR, and shoot fast action, just like you know a Sports Illustrated guy would. You just have to work a little harder knowing about the, the lack of additional frames and also timing. So... Um, but it allows you to compose and recompose much faster and do a focus lock as you're tracking. I am very old school in the fact that when I'm shooting, even though I have cameras that are capable of 12 to 20 frames a second, I still shoot like I'm shooting film and I'm counting the frames off in my head. The other side of the coin is that if you're shooting with your finger on the button, just machine gunning it, you've got to go back and look at 100,000 frames that you just shot. And you might as well just shoot video at that point. Um, you know, you, you need to have a workable body of work. Um, so understanding body language, understanding the sport or action is important. Practicing um, and, and knowing that as they're moving through the scene, tracking is important because even with the eye tracking and all this other great stuff they have in the cameras, they're not 100%. And um, actually, in the, 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 the presentation that I'm doing for you guys on Friday, that surface shot, I actually have 131 frame sequence that I did. And I showed out of that sequence, there are three out of focus frames. And I left them in the sequence because I wanted to show people how quickly the lens and camera combination pull back into focus by doing the back button and allowing you to work like you should. So, um, I, I mean, I learned how to shoot sports on a fully manual camera with no autofocus or a speed winder. So I'm pulling them off, composing, zooming, doing the whole thing all at one time. And that back button becomes real important in allowing you to compose and recompose and make sure that you've got a focus lock. So Are you saying you're pulling your thumb, you're, you're disengaging the back button and then re-engaging for it to re... Yeah. Okay. Right. So if you think about this for a second, you've got a... Uh, one of my favorite sports to shoot is lacrosse. And it, it's a combination of hockey, soccer, and football all wrapped into one. And these guys and girls are moving at wicked speeds across the field. So as they take 
two steps. Somewhere between that second step as they're going through the next step, they've changed enough information in your, your zone of focus that you need to recompose. So even as good as all of these faster cameras, even like a 1DX or a D6, um, as good as they are on tracking, you're going to lose frames. So by composing and recomposing and knowing that, okay, they're still in my depth of field here, 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 and here. And I'm watching for the more important facial expressions, the, the body actions, the motions. Um, I want to make sure that I've got, you know, the ball in the net of the, the, the stick or as he's about to, to hit somebody or tackle or whatever, I'm concentrating on the action and, and just following all of that as it goes along. So watching the timing and everything with, with that as well. And that's an incredibly useful skill to have because I've, I've talked to other photographers that, uh, that shot film in the day, you know, that were photographing, um, uh, you know, sports, like especially like baseball and hockey. Uh, and when you're shooting film, you, you have to get your timing just right. I mean, especially if you want to get the ball right before it makes contact with the bat. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I think that's, that's a great thing to learn is, you know, go to a high school game, go to a college game and, you know, practice that skill. And, uh, you know, I guess test your, your own muscles, uh, to see how, how quickly your response is to, you know, how, how close am I getting to that? It's great oh, yeah. that you can shoot 20 frames a second, but, you know, setting it on single or, or even a three second burst or three frame burst, that's, a uh, it Pretty is. Cool. And, and I, I, I've shot eight years of U.S. Open tennis. So, you, you know, you talk about shooting specific things. You want a forehand, a backhand, a return, a volley, um, whatever it is. You've, you've got to understand the body language and know that regardless of what camera you're shooting with, if you have all of these pieces in place, it's very easy to do. But practice, 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 practice. Um, and then, of course, the composition of the, the final image of well, what's in it. Is it a great action shot or is this the cover of Sports Illustrated kind of a thing? So I, I've seen people with absolutely no skills whatsoever get amazing images. And people who are seasoned photographers come back with horrid images. And you, you start scratching your head. You're like, OK, what just happened here? Um, and, and the difference between a, a non-professional professional is be able to repeat, repeat that performance and, and be able to say, OK, here it is. Let me do it again. And that's where the practice comes into play. So even as an amateur or hobbyist, practice is important. Yes, absolutely. Uh, also, I had a few people ask this. Uh, what software do you use for processing or do you do much processing? Um, there's a yes and no answer in there. You know, in a perfect world, you get it right in camera because it let's let's face fact, if it's a crappy image, it's going to be crappy after Photoshop or whatever platform. Um, or you can sell it to a client saying this is a creative, artistic thing. Um, I, I've seen that happen, too. Um, but generally, I'm working in most Adobe products. But uh, again, being in the industry, as long as I have, I've worked with every platform out there. Um, you know, Capture One is a great platform. Lightroom is great. Photoshop is great. As long as you understand the tools that you're looking for and working with, and you can negate any of the other things that you, you don't want to use. Um, there are lots of other platforms. There are free softwares that are not going to necessarily be as good as Capture One or Adobe because those two firms work with the manufacturers on raw development and processing. Um, you get a free software for raw development out of the box with your camera. Those are always going to be the tightest to take it from a raw file to JPEG TIFF or a DNG. So you could take it to another platform and experiment with it or work with it. Um, but remember, it's, you know, you want simple edits. You don't want to have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to what you've shot. You know, you do a nine to five job during the day. Editing images should not be a task of 40 or 50 hours it should be a simple exposure, highlight shadow, you know, a little density in there and move on to the next image. I could not agree more. <laughs> I, I think you touched on this, uh, this next question. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, but I think it's good to go over it one more time. I had somebody ask about uh, what ND filters do you use on, this is asking for a specific lens, uh, but it says, what, what do you use for ND, uh, what ND filters do you use for air shows this one's asking specifically about the 150 to 600. 
Okay, so ND filters um, tend to start getting expensive as you start cre creeping up there in size. And typically in store, and you, you can correct me on this, Tyler, is that you guys will carry up to about a 95 millimeter and you only keep a few of them on hand because, again, they get pricey. Um, yes. There are many different manufacturers and everybody's got a preference. Um, what I will tell you is that personally, I'm using a company called Haida, H-A-I-D-A. -A. Um, they're very affordable um, and they seem to be the cleanest from what I've worked with so far because I have them at 105 and 105 millimeter. So I, I carry both of those with me. Um, Haida also makes a drop-in kit for the 14 to 24 lens that has that little filter thingy on the back of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but ProMaster makes ND filters and they're the ProMaster filters are actually made by a recognized, uh, filter manufacturer called, um, mm -hmm. Hoya. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even though they come with a no name name on it, they're still made by a recognized brand and everybody gets the same glass from the same places. So, um, they're all relatively good or high quality, depending on the level that you pay for, um, you know, B plus W, um, is another notable name. Tiffin makes some great stuff, uh, especially as you get into broadcast. So ProMaster has, has some very great different level of filters that you can use too. Um, we make filters. We don't make ND filters, unfortunately. I wish we did, so I would have all Sigma ND filters in my bag. Um, but yeah, what you need to watch out for is that Certain ND filters will give you a different color cast on different sensors, depending on the cameras used. So take note, you may get a red or green cast to your image based on Canon, Nikon, Sony, and whose brand filter you use. So that may require a little bit of a tweak in your white balancing because of that color cast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and ProMaster, that's a major brand that we, uh, we sell in the stores. And uh, I've, I've personally been using them and I can personally, uh, uh, you know, attest to their, their quality. I, I think they're fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you, you mentioned earlier um, that you, you were talking about shooting uh, prop planes and getting that blur of the, of the prop, but getting the plane in focus. I mean, you're, you're panning while you're shooting. And I think that's, that's the main part about that. Uh, but you mentioned a one and a half stop ND uh, that you generally use when you're, you're shooting a slower shutter speed for those planes. Yes. So what you're actually doing is you're cutting the light. That's the transmission of light that's coming in. So you're maintaining the integrity of that blue sky. So you don't have to go back to Photoshop and over sharpen or really tweak color channels. Um, it's in the, motion picture industry they actually use nd filters when they're transitioning from indoors to outdoors so you don't have that change in light so most higher end cine cameras actually have nd filters built in and you can use an nd filter to do um, slow motion waterfalls or, or stuff like that in the middle of the day and the popular one is the 10 stop nd filter so you could do the creamy waterfall in the middle of the day and, and get all that beautiful stuff what I will tell you is that um, start with a lesser density filter and you can actually stack up to three if you're using a single density. There are variable ND filters. And again, be careful because if you stop down too much, you can get something called cross hatching, which puts some anomalies in the image, which you don't want. Um, so you kind of have to be very discerning on how many stops that you want to cut light and how lower low you want your iso to be so a little experimentation in there is always good um i mean that's I, i've always thought about putting a class together about filters and when where and how to use them so uh and and that's it's become more prevalent especially with digital because uh when digital first started you know you'd throw an old film uh, filter on there and it had no effect on anything whatsoever now the filters have become very specific and it affects how the camera thinks so, um, yeah, that would be something that I would, I would work with. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you made a good point about the, I think it was the 14 to 24 
uh, that that has a filter slot in the back of it uh, behind that uh, last element of glass, not only for the physical reason of it's a bulbous front element, so you really can't thread something on the front of it, but there are inherent benefits to having the filter between the sensor and the rear part of the glass. Uh, so I think that was interesting that you, you pointed that out as well. Yeah. I mean, there are some companies that do make some holders that will go on the front. Um, not sure if you guys carry any of the leaf filter systems in store or Ben. carry some of the flat filters, the four yeah, by you, six. Yeah, you do the, the big square plates. So if you're willing to carry that extra heft in your bag, um, then, then, you know, that's another way to go because then you can use graduated or a circular polarizer. Um, I have a couple of different filter systems and actually one of them is from a company called Photodiox and it uses a 145 millimeter circular polarizer, which is tremendous. Um, and it just enormous heft on the front of that lens. And it looks like I'm launching missiles or, you know, taking pictures of a telescope from outer space. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are ways around that as well. Um, it's neat to have that drop-in filter on the back of some of the lenses, which is kind of neat. Definitely. I'm looking at the last few questions here. Feel free to put in, uh, uh any more last questions you have. I know we have about seven more minutes until, <laughs> until this class is officially over. Um, uh, but let me see, uh, Sharon asking, how do you pan when taking photos of moving subjects? Like, I know you're talking about planes or, or, you know, sports, things like that. So it, it's kind of like a golf swing. So you've got to lock focus on them in the beginning and try and, and practice your speed of movement as you're, you're shooting with them. And I'm sitting in a chair that I can actually spin, but you know, you, you need to kind of get your right stance or like a golf swing. You want to follow through. You don't want to be jerky with it because it, it will hurt you in the long run. So that's also where speed of subject and trying to keep focus. So if, if you're trying to shoot a more telephoto image or, or a more narrow image of someone running down the field, it takes a lot of practice because they run in and out of the frame. And I could show you aviation images where I've got the front of the plane, the back of the plane, the middle of the plane, the wingtip, blue sky, where I overpanned or underpanned um, same thing in motocross, same thing in football and lacrosse, or I'm zoomed so far in that I've lost where they are in the frame. So I've got to back off, find them, relock, recompose and start again. Um, surfing does that to me quite a bit because I try to fill my frame with the surfer and as much of, of the information that I can from the beach, but sometimes they'll, they'll cut in a wave and they're, they're moving so fast on me that it's like they turn left and I'm still going right. And I've got to jump back and, and find them again. So it's like, oh, got to back off and, and zoom in again and hope that I can get them before they bail from their wave. And sometimes uh, it works, sometimes it doesn't. And um, I just don't like to show the mistakes. That's all. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I had a few people say they would like, they would be interested in a class on filters. Uh, so uh, there's, there's that input. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of uh, other questions at the end here. Uh, this is interesting. Best concert event lenses. What, what type of focal lengths are you generally using in those atmospheres? Okay, so um, believe it or not, my two favorite concert lenses are the 18 to 35 and the 50 to 100 for most venues. The 120 to 300 allows me to back off to the sound um, stage and and shoot from further back because, you know, on a professional show where they're giving you three and out most of the time, you, you know, you can't stay through the whole show. So I've got to back off to the soundboard and, or from another point in a venue and you, you don't want to be seen. Otherwise you get in a little bit of trouble. Um, so the longer lens, faster aperture, you know, every venue is a little different. You've got to decide um, lighting stages. You know, I, I've shot in venues where, the, again, they've got the refrigerator bulb over the stage and that's their lighting. Um, I've shot in places where they have full theatrical stages and it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, fast apertures are usually preferable. Um, you want something wide, but not too wide necessarily. A little bit of telephoto so you can change your point of view because always looking up underneath, you know, the, the performer's nose is not a good thing. Um, concentrate on all of the band members so you need to be able to move around a little bit get the drummer get the bassist get the singer get the guitarist um 
you know, it's it all it all varies. Um, I did a show just a couple of weeks ago with one camera, one lens, and I pushed myself to use the uh, the thirty five one four because that was I challenged myself to work with one lens. You know, rather than be able to go back to a bag and have you know four or five different choices, you also don't want to be kicking around stuff in the dark trying to change lenses in a crowded place because that's a great place to lose things or have them stolen. Um, and we, we like to think that everybody's honest, but not always the case. Um, so try different things. You've got to kind of figure out based on if you go to a, a place that you like to shoot at or you have access to on a regular basis, what works for you? You know, where are you standing in relationship to the musicians? Um, the, the, the last band that I work with, they, they had this thing where they came out to me in the audience and they wanted to get as close as they could to my camera lens. So I've actually got this like woolly mammoth beast of a guitarist sticking his face right in my camera, you know, just going crazy. It's a great fun image, but it's on that borderline. Like I kept having to back up a little bit and I was afraid of knocking somebody over because I, I just I needed to keep his face in focus. But it was um, experiment. Um, you know, every venue is going to be a little different and it, and it couldn't hurt to have a zoom lens. But fast apertures definitely help. That's for sure. Definitely, especially when the lights are moving, depending on the part of the song, it's it's hard to predict it. <laughs> you don't know how they program that song. Um, uh, so Dan, last question I'm seeing here uh, before we go. Dan had a good question. Uh, I think this is, uh, it says, why use an indie filter for air shows when you can reduce your ISO? Because you can't go below ISO 50 in most cases. And actually, most cases, ISO 100 is your base. Some cameras will allow you to go to ISO 50 on a real high end and, and very selective uh, case. You'll be able to go to ISO 25, which is next to unheard of. But when you start dropping that shutter speed, um, you're going to have to stop down to F11, F14, F22, and you're not in the sharpest part of the lens. So I want to stay between F11 and F14, which is the sharpest part of that 150 to 600 in my mind. And um that works for me because that gives me the sky that i need and it also gives me the depth of field on the aircraft so um the images are sharp and even though that it looks tack sharp in the viewfinder when you go to zoom in i want to see the razor stubble on the guy's face because he was up at six o'clock for the for the uh for the photo call and you know um he didn't shave so <laughs> So uh, Steve dropped in a question uh, right as we were going over that one. This is uh, really interesting as well. Uh, going back to concert photography or event photography, uh, how do you shoot when the lighting color keeps changing? Like what type of white balance are you generally using or, or something like that? Ah, uh, one of my favorite tools. And of course, I don't have one near close by that I can just throw it up and show you what it looks like. Um, Depending on the places, LED lighting is next to impossible to correct for because it's just a wonky kind of a thing. Um, so, but basically what I do is I try to get to the venue early and I look to see if there's anybody in, in the sound booth because he's also your lighting guy. And I'll have him turn on a couple of different lights and I will take a reference with something called a color checker. And it's my first frame of reference and I forget about it because then I can go back and correct to a baseline white balance from that. If that's not available to you, um, the two things that I actually look for in editing is a black point or a white point. Um, so when I go into like my raw development tool, I'll grab the little eyedropper tool and I'll find something that is as close to pure black as I can, sample that and then watch the skin tones. You'll notice that your skin tones come back into pretty close to normal. And then you have the choice of doing either a magenta or a green shift and kind of pull that back in there. Um, most of the time, those LED lights are going to be the coldest uh, lighting available, and you can't go any further in the Kelvin scale. Um, but yeah, that's it's it's either reference with a color checker and do a a quick a white balance adjustment from that to give me a good baseline, or black point or white point. White point is a little bit more difficult because um, there is so many different shades of white. You know, you could have a little bit of blue or green or yellow in there and it, and it kind of shifts, but watch the skin tones and look for the, the transition and what looks natural or unnatural based on 
your remembrance of the situation. You know, sometimes if you're if you're a hardcore musician, look at the color of the instruments. I mean, there are certain paint schemes that you know for a fact that this is that green or it is that color. Um, <clears throat> and that that comes into play with a lot of different things that I shoot commercially because uh, companies will remember, you know, Coca-Cola Red, Citibank Blue. They know their colors. And if those colors deviate and shift, not a good thing. Yeah, Fender and Gibson will not be happy with uh, the way, you know, you, the color you used on their guitar. <laughs> That's exactly it. That is exactly it. Especially if they're going to ask you to, uh, you know, commission something or, you know, <laughs> use it for rights yeah. or something like that. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's very cool. Uh, well, well uh, Mark, this has been great. Uh, I've, uh, I know a lot of people have enjoyed this. I, I certainly have. Uh, I'm going to make sure. Let's see. Scroll down here. Yeah, this is this has been a really good class. I think you covered a lot of different types of photography, uh, and I know you have another class coming in uh, on Friday, so that'll be uh, uh, that'll be exciting as well. Um, yeah, we, we had a lot of great questions, um, but uh, if, uh, Mark, is there a good way people can follow you on social media or if you do that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have I I do have an Instagram page. It's Mark Farb, and it's M A R C uh, dot F A R B. Um, I'm very selective of what I put up there just because of kind of being a public figure and working for a Japanese company. Um, I do actually have some new stuff that I need to add in there. Um, but you can also find me at Sigma. Um, you know, it's mfarb at sigmaphoto.com. So more than happy to answer questions. You can call in through the tech line and more than likely it's me that's answering the phone. But if I'm not there, they can actually forward your contact information to me. You guys have my contact information as well. So I, I encourage anybody that's in driving distance from one of the Bedford locations, go in and see these guys and girls. Dynamite, Dynamite, family owned and operated operation. Know these guys for many, 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 many years. Um, love visiting when, I, when I'm afforded the opportunity and um, they have a wealth of knowledge and experience. So, um, you know, go in say hello, see them, pick stuff up, play, you know, Buy many things, buy often is, is the best thing that I can say. But um, yeah, I mean, that's whether through the store or through Sigma directly. I mean, that's, you know, you guys can find me, but I am on Instagram um, and I, I do Facebook too. So it's, and you can find me, I don't hide. It's Mark Farb. Um, pretty simple. Awesome. Yeah. And if, if y'all are interested in those other classes, uh, please visit us on our, U, our, our, our Facebook page. Uh, we have all of our different events uh, between now and the rest of the year. Uh, so if you want to see Mark on Friday, you know where to go. <laughs> and uh, this is being recorded. So I would uh, give YouTube a little bit of uh, some time uh, for the rest of the day for them to process this video. So you can watch this again later, because uh, I know all of you will have plenty of notes to go over again, because Mark, you had such good info. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, you know, and the only other thing that we have to do is just, you know, you guys need to have Brian bring me out there to do like a hands on in store. So or take it, take people out. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's a dynamite place to be. I, like I said, it's been it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to come in and, and see you guys. But uh, uh, never, never, ever had a bad visit. And I know that um, you guys have a killer staff. Thank you. We, we appreciate that. Uh, and, and for those of you that don't live within uh, uh, you know, a driving range of our one of our brick and mortar stores, please visit us on uh, at bedfords.com, B-E-D-F-O-R-D-S. Uh, we're always there on our chat as well as uh, social media channels as well. Uh, that's if you can't make it into one of our physical locations. Uh, but uh, Mark, this has been great. Uh, really appreciate uh, all the all the, the insight, uh, and not just from the technical side, but even the relational side. I think that that's another part of photography that that can get lost. Uh, but I'm glad you you talked about that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, this has been a really good session. I know we're we're a little bit over, but uh, we're gonna let everybody get on with their day. And uh, Mark, we will see you again, sir. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Same here. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. All right. See you, everybody.